Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 6. I want to speak on the subject that you're so familiar with it that you really don't understand it. You heard it so many times, but it really never dawned on you as the way I'm going to present it to you. Let me read the text, then I'll give you a short snippet, and then I'll introduce my subject. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. There's a big if here. For if, if ye forgive men, not devils, not angels, men, people. If you forgive people, their trespasses against you. Meaning the people will trespass, sin, offend and hurt you. Your heavenly father will also forgive you. Because you sin against him. But, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. If you don't forgive, God won't forgive you. That's the deal here. If you want God to forgive you, you have to forgive others. This is not an option. It's a must. You and I must forgive. The problem is we don't understand what the word forgive means. I want to let you know it's hard to forgive. And it's even harder to forget. My subject is the grace to forgive. If God don't give you grace, and I will show you how you need grace to forgive. If you don't have the grace of God, you will never be able to forgive. Because forgiving is not human. Forgiving to her is human, but to forgive is divine. It takes divine grace to enable you to forgive. And to go beyond that, it takes divine power to cause you to forget. My subject, the grace to forgive. My theme, the power to forget. Because some people can forgive, but they cannot forget. Two sisters, they fought all their lives. They were in the 80s now. They never agreed one day. So one was in the hospital, probably is going to die, and so they... Other sister decided to finally go and talk with her because, you know, this might be her last chance. Went to the bed and they began to talk and they asked for forgiveness. Sister, would you forgive me? You know, for years we haven't talked to each other. And the lady on the bed was about to die. She said, look, I forgive you. I really do. But if I get out of this bed, things remain the same. We will continue the fight. People don't understand what forgiveness is. To some people, it's idle words tossed at a situation. Yeah. Well, I forgive you. Yeah. What kind of attitude is that? I want to explain forgiveness. The grace to forgive and the power to forget. I would like to reason with you and say sometimes people will remember. I have... And why I am going from scripture to scripture is because everything I say to you today, I want to have a scripture to support it and stay in the context of that so that I'm not giving you my opinion. And the first scripture I want to refer to is found in Luke. And, and it's interesting why I go to this passage because let's go to it. Luke 17. My first point is has three, three categories. It has the offender, the offended, and the offense. Let's find it in these few verses. Luke 17, 1 through 4. And I'm, this is not my style, but I have to give you the word of God as, as it comes. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, It is impossible, 
but that offenses will come. He said, listen, as long as you are living, offenses will come. People will offend you. As long as you are in this flesh, somebody is going to step on your toes sometime. And they may hurt you badly. He says, offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Here we have the offended, the offense, and the offender. Woe unto him who causes the offense. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he's cast into the sea. Then he should offend or cause someone to backslide or stumble. That's what it means here. To offend these little ones, young in faith. If you cause somebody to backslide because you offended them, it's best you put a millstone around your neck and go jump in the sea is what he's saying. Take heed to yourselves. Watch yourself. If thy brother trespass against thee, correct him. And if he repent, forgive him. It gets a little more complicated. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day. And seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent. You shall forgive him. No negotiations, no options. If he repents, you in one day must forgive him seven times. Apostles heard that, hear what they said in verse 5. The apostles said unto him, Lord, hey, increase our faith, faith, brother. To do what you say, we need a little more faith here. This is, this is going to take some grace. This is going to take some divine enabling for me to forgive my brother seven times in one day. Lord, I need grace to do that. Anybody with me? It takes grace to forgive. It takes faith in God to forgive somebody seven times in one day. The offense, whatever it is, somebody's offended. And then the offender... We have to patch this up because my second point is not only the offense, the offender, and the offended, but the second thing I want to mention to you is found in Ephesians chapter 4. Very important. I need to define the word forgive. The word forgive in Greek has different applications. In one application, the same word which we understand from the text, forgive, is used when Jesus went to Peter's mother-in-law and she was sick with a fever and he touched her and the fever left her immediately. That is what the word forgive means in the Greek. To leave immediately, to dismiss, to send away, to drive out, to cancel, to expel. And if you're going to forgive somebody, it means that the offense that you harbored must be driven out, sent away, dismissed, canceled, to the point you will forget it. Anybody with me? Okay, let's read Ephesians 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. If you harbor unforgiveness in your heart, And will not let that person or issue go or die or be buried. You will only grieve the Holy Spirit in your heart. Because forgiveness is from God and by God's help. And if the Holy Spirit is in you moving you to forgive. And you resist the urge of the Spirit to forgive. You will just grieve him. Because unforgiveness breeds a few things. In verse 31, let all bitterness. Are you a bitter person? Do you drink lemon juice every morning? Is it that every time somebody meets you, you're very cut up? You know, you know, colloquial language. Well, how are you so cut up? You're so bitter. You're so grouchy. You're easily ticked off. Somebody just have to say boo on you. You've gone off on a long hoo-hoo. Yeah, come see, come sir. 
Bitterness. Your soul is bitter. Anything comes out of you is an insult. There is no sweetness in your language. Very caustic, insultive, and damaging. Because you are bitter. Let all bitterness and wrath. You are always ready for a fight. Anybody approach you? Hey, what do you want? You have an attitude. You're always ready to take it on. Bring it on, brother. You met your match finally. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger. Are you angry? How long have you been angry? How long will you continue to be angry? And clamor. 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 To harass with your voice. To nag. Nagging is clamoring, ladies. Don't you know? Clamor. Clamor. Nag. Loudness. Loudness. Clamoring. And evil speaking. Wow. Watch the word. Be put away. Be driven out. Be expelled. Cancel it from your life. Get it out. Put away the malice. And be ye kind. One to another. Oh my God. The opposite. You know, I would be happy if Paul was talking to ungodly, unchurch sinners. He is talking to the Ephesians, the Alps of the New Testament. The highest doctrinal content in any book is found in this Ephesians epistle. To these highly educated, intellectual, spiritual Christians. Look at the language he's speaking to them and asking them to get it out of their lives and to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Remember that God forgave you. And because he forgave you, you ought to forgive one another. Can I hear an amen somewhere? We've got to forgive. You, because God has forgiven you, you have to forgive. There is no options. There is no uh, negotiations here. Forgiveness must take place because if you don't forgive god said neither will i forgive you but you say pastor like you have no experience in life at all don't you know it's hard to forgive that's why i'm saying it takes grace god's grace to enable us to forgive and pastor you're talking like a sunday school kid don't you know that some people have hurt me so badly that although I forgive them, I just can't forget them. I just can't get them out of my system. Whenever I see them, they turn me off. If I see them coming down this aisle, I walk down that one. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Because I've been burnt once. And he said seven times. You got to get burned seven times before you even go into tomorrow. That's just today. Where is the long suffering? Where is the tolerance? Where is the putting up with my brother who irritates me? With my sister who annoys me? Where is the grace of God in our lives? Or are we no better than the ungodly and the unchurch? If we claim to be filled with the spirit, where is the ability of God in our hearts to be bigger than the circumstance? Where is it? Could you give Jesus praise a little? I want to show you that it's okay to remember. Because you will remember. I cannot deny what happened to me. You can't see it from there, but I have a, a long scar here. 
every time I see it, although it healed up a long time ago, I remember what brought this on. I remember that I was stupid and 16, but these Western movies we used to see was the cause of what I'm going to describe. The train was passing, this is true. And a fellow and I was fighting on the side of the train. The train is passing, we are right on the side fighting. He has a knife and I have a big mouth. <laughs> and you know who's going to win. So he, he, he threw three stabs at me. Two struck me here, but I had a hard abdomen. I used to pump iron. So it really kind of, the knife folded back and it came on my hands and it cut me deep here. And so we patched that up long ago, but the scar is still here. And I still remember what happened when I was 16 years old. But while I remember because of the scar, I have forgotten the pain that it brought at the time. That's where I'm going. That you will remember, but you don't have to carry the pain of what you remember. Let me illustrate that in two apostles. Both Paul, the apostle, and John, the apostle, had Two bad experiences with men and they remembered them. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul is speaking to his son, Timothy, in the faith. And he's reminding him of a few things and he says this to him in 4.14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Could you imagine that he's talking to his son and he's bringing this up? Alexander did me much evil. And the Lord rewarded him according to his works. While Paul remembered what Alexander did to him, Paul did not attempt to take vengeance. He left it to the Lord. And he's now saying, the Lord had rewarded him according to his works. But I remember the evil that he had done to me. It's okay to remember, but it's not okay to seek revenge. Can I hear somebody say amen? Because you're human, you will not forget. You will see the scars and you will see the damage. You will remember the event, but you will not carry the pain. If you're still carrying the pain, you have not been healed. Not only that, he, he, he had mentioned it the first time. This was such a traumatic experience of Paul. In the first epistle, he said, in one... Uh, 19, beholding the faith in good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. They have wrecked their faith. These are believers who have backslidden. And he names two men of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander. The same guy shows up again. He had given, he had done Paul much evil. Who is the Alexander in your life? Who has done you much harm, much hurt, much evil? Who have made your life miserable? And who you have marked down in your black book? Waiting for an opportunity to avenge yourself or to attack. And not only Paul had a problem with a brother, but even the mighty apostle himself, John, the longest living apostle. He met with a fella in a church in, in his third epistle. Down just before Jude. He's writing to Gaius, the elder, the well-beloved whom I love in the truth. He's saluting this brother Gaius and he's talking. And he's saying to him in verse 10. That I wrote unto the church. But Diotrephes... Who loves to have the preeminence among the brethren rejected us. Yeah, yeah. Could you imagine that? The only living apostle. The one who walked with Jesus is going to a church. And this fellow who just loved to boss the church and rule the church and have the preeminence. He rejected the apostleship. Hear what he said. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds. 
John's going to remember what he's done. And here what he's going to remember. He was prating against us with malicious words. Happened to John. Why won't happen to you and me? Prating or speaking evil against the apostle with malicious words. And not content with that. He wasn't happy with that. He doesn't receive the brethren and he forbids them who would. And if they receive the brethren in forgiveness, he casts them out of the church. What kind of fellow is this? What kind of pastor leader is this? That if you don't do the way he does it, he will throw you out of the church. If you don't hate the ones he hates, and you love the one he doesn't like, he throws you out of the church. John said, I remember this guy, and when I come, I'm going to deal with him. I'm going to give him severe mercy. So, sometimes we have to remember. Because in remembering, we protect ourselves from repeated hurt. If you know they threw a set of nails in that road there and your tire got punctured. The next time you drive there, you're going to watch carefully to see if you see a nail. Because you don't want the repeat experience of having to change a tire. But you know, some of us don't get it. Let me explain. I was talking to a brother who had difficulty. And he came to me and said, Pastor... I just don't understand this. That brother, that sister will not talk to me. Okay, so we had a little falling out. I went and said, brother, please forgive me. And they said they forgive me, but they won't talk to me. They won't have nothing to do with me. I don't understand that, pastor. How we could go to the same church, and I'm passing this way, and he's passing that way, and she's down there, and we're not having a, a fellowship. And the word of the Lord came to me, and I gave him a parable. I said, brother, listen to what's happening in this particular situation, not everywhere else. I said, I have a stone in my hand. I'm going to hit you with it. I'm going to strike you in your forehead. Wham! Pow! Ah. Oh, brother, you busted my head. Pay. I run to, oh, please forgive me, brother. I didn't mean that. I didn't know that this stone would, would, would bust your head. I didn't know. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Okay. I forgive you. The next day, I see the brother coming down with a stone in his hand. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Move the other side quickly. <laughs> so the fellow who has the stone in his hand has not dropped the stone. When you see him, if you see his hand is empty, it's fine. But if you still see the same stone. So the brother with the stone who asked forgiveness and was given forgiveness doesn't understand why the other person is walking down the other way because you still got the stone in your hand. And the person is scared. Doesn't want to be hit again. Understand something here. The offender and the offended. Because when you struck with the stone, you didn't realize how deep the damage was. You didn't realize how it affected that person for days and for weeks. They pained. They were hurting. You got forgiveness and you went your merry way. But you left damage. And you know what you have to do? Is to give that person time to heal. Leave that person alone. You have been forgiven. But every time they see you coming and your hand behind your back, they're thinking you're coming to smite again. 
You've got to let things simmer down. Don't rush it and try to fix it and cure the wound right away. When you offend somebody or somebody offend you and they settle it with forgiveness, back off. Let it simmer down. Give it time to heal as I will show you in an illustration how only time, only time will heal some wounds. It's amazing that the most damaged place is marriage. It's amazing how the five things I just showed you from Paul that we have to get rid of our lives. The anger, the bitterness, the malice, the evil speaking happens between married couples. It is as if the enemy you're sleeping with. May I say to you humbly, your wife is not your enemy. Your husband is not the foe and you not to treat them like that not to treat your children get it out of your home get it out of your vocabulary get it out of your life get it out of your memory purge yourself purge yourself from these things and love one another and be kind to one another and be tender hearted have powers of compassion let the love of God flow into our heart and flow out to one another if we can't love at home you can't love in the church forget the hypocrisy can't do it we need the grace to forgive but we also need the power to forget because it's easy to say I forgive you but it's so difficult for me to forget you and there are times when you have to remember but you don't have to carry the hurt with you because if you're still carrying the hurt you are not healed let me give you one illustration and close. Found in the book of Genesis, chapter 27. You are aware that Isaac is old and blind. He was about to give the first right blessings to his eldest son, Esau. Isaac says, Esau, go cook me the best venison you can find. Bring it for me and I will bless you. Well, Rebecca heard that, didn't like it. She preferred Jacob. She dressed him up like Isaac, like Esau, and cooked the deer and sent it to his father. Father, hmm, who's this? Oh, I am Esau, your firstborn. Liar. To Jacob. Bless me. So he ate and he blessed him. As soon as he was walking out of the tent, in walking was Esau with nice cook venison. Verse 33, and Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, who, who, where is he? I have taken the venison and brought it to me. I, I have eaten it all before him. I blessed him and he shall be blessed. Three times. Three times in the next few verses, Esau will cry. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry. Because he was robbed by his brother. Deceived his father and stole what was his. Verse 38, Esau said on his father, you, don't you have one blessing for me, my father? Don't you have a little something for me? Gave him a little blessing. Verse 41 sums it up. And Esau hated Jacob. Not disliked. Not disapproved. Not say I will just not talk to you briefly. He hated him. Hated, hated, angry, bitter, boiling hate. How do I know? Read on. He hated him because the blessings were which his father blessed him. 
Now, I know that there are some Christians who hate you because you got blessed. But that's not the point. The point is he stole the blessing. He robbed his brother. If any man had any reason to be angry was Esau. And he said in his heart, Esau, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then I will slay my brother, Jacob. I will kill him. The hate translated into murder. Intent to kill. It's not a small matter. The word came to Rebecca. She said, now hear my voice. Flee! Run! Hit and run. Damage and run. Thief and run. How far are you going to run? How long are you going to run? Where will you hide? She told him to run. And tarry with my brother, your uncle, a few days until thy brother's fury is turned away. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee and he forget. And he forget that which you had done to him. She thought it would take a few days for Esau to forget. What Jacob had done to him. While all the time in his heart. Hate turned into murder. It took him 20 years to forget. 20 years later God said to Jacob. Go back home. He would face the one thing he was running from all his life. And he trembled. When he reached the fort, Jabok, he sent his family ahead. He stayed on. God met him that night at Peniel, changed his life from Jacob to Israel. But he was still afraid of his brother because he heard the news that Esau is coming down with 400 warriors, 400 armed soldiers coming, Jacob, coming. His heart trembled. I was said, he bowed down seven times. Before he went and met his brother. All in penitence. So he saw. He said, all I have is thine. Two men said a f- two phrases that nobody in scripture has ever said. When he offered Esau and said, all that I have is thine. Esau said. It's okay, brother. I have enough. You ever gave anybody something and they told you they have enough? Nobody has, does ever have enough. If they even have a million and you give them a hundred grand, sure, we always have room for more. (laughs) But, But these two men, the only two in scripture said, I don't want your material thing. God bless me also. Because Esau had forgiven Jacob long time ago. That's why he could meet his brother. They hugged and they kissed. And they threw a great party. And they went their separate ways. It took 20 years. Maybe not right now in your life that you are able to forgive. Or worse, forget. But like Paul himself in Ephesians 3.13. He would come back and say to the church, you know what? Let forget those things which are behind. And I am going to press. Not push. See, that's a big difference. You can't be pushy. And you can't push your agenda on people. And you can't push your time schedule on people. But you could press. Press mean to inch your way, inch your way, inch your way. Press in, press in, press. Forgetting those things. Brother, you have to 
forget them. There will come a time in your life when you're pulling too much baggage behind you and it slows down your progress and you must decide to forget those things which are behind you and press towards the mark of the prize. There is a prize ahead waiting for you. Press for it. Press. Press into your high calling. Forget those things. I know it's hard. Your wife, your husband has been unfaithful to you. They abused you. In your past childhood, somebody took advantage of you. You remember them? 25, 40 years ago, things still haunt you. You're still carrying that hurt. You're still carrying the pain. You have not let go. You have not truly forgiven. My text says, if you don't forgive, those who trespass against you, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. Jeremiah, David, and Isaiah said many times two powerful truths. Many scriptures I can quote. Said, the Lord... I am the Lord who forgives you your sins and I have forgotten your trespasses. He forgives and he forgets. In Greek mythology, there is a river called Lethe, L-E-T-H-E, or Lethe. It's the river of forgetfulness. Anybody who supposedly drinks from the river of forgetfulness will forget everything bad that was done to them. God doesn't have a river. He has an ocean. He said, I will cast your sins into the sea of forgetfulness and I will remember them no more. And if God will forgive you and forget it and won't remember it anymore, he wants you to be like him, to forgive and by his power forget. Leave it alone. Cast it out. Put it away. Don't let it be an issue anymore. Yes, we certainly need the grace to forgive. And the power to forget. Jesus didn't have an issue when he said, Father, forgive them. Forget them. For they know not what they do. One elderly lady had a problem with that. Somebody had really offended them, a whole group. She said, Father, don't forgive them. Because they well know what they do. <laughs> I only brought that into human Europe a little bit because I know it's a serious thing. But who is your Alexander? Who has done you much hurt and evil? Who is your diatrophies? Who exercises lordship over you and tries to control? you and cast you out of their fellowship and company. Who has offended you? Who is the offender in your life that you must forgive? I am not going to hang around the service as soon as the service I'm cutting out. Why? I'm going to meet a brother. He's in town. I have done him no wrong. But he has done me three wrongs. He has hurt he has damaged me. It took me six months to get over to him. He has not talked to me for five months. We were great friends for seven years. Every time. And yesterday I heard that he's in town. I am running to go and meet him. To tell him, brother, I have nothing against you. And if you have done anything against me, I've 
really forgive you. I just want to hug you. I could talk to him on the phone. But I feel I need to go in person. And just hold him and hug him. And let him know he doesn't have to carry that burden. And that I am not offended. By the grace of God, I can forgive. And by the strength of the Lord, I can forget. End of subject.